Hello, and welcome to Enabling Multidisciplinary Learning Through Digital Education, a webinar discussion held in partnership between Times Higher Education and Coursera for Campus. My name is Ashton Wemborn, I'm the Special Projects Deputy Editor at THE, and I'll be chairing today's session. So we're joined today by a panel of experts and decision makers from India's higher education sector. So I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Monica Kanna, Director of the KJ Samaya Institute of Management, Dr. Amit Garg, Director of the KIET Group of Institutions, and Raghav Gupta, Managing Director at Coursera. Thank you to our panel for speaking with us today and to our, our audience for joining the webinar. We'll be taking questions from the audience throughout the session today. Um, so please do enter those in the Q&A box, which is just at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those. As Indian universities continue to shift their teaching and assessment online, digital and hybrid education is helping to drive innovation for staff and students. Central to the success of this shift are multidisciplinary student journeys, which are becoming increasingly important when equipping graduates with the skills and knowledge they need for the fast changing modern world. So I'd like to begin today's discussion by considering that collaborative approach that I've just outlined. India's national education policy outlines the need for a holistic and multidisciplinary model of education. So I'd like to ask our panel, what are the benefits of taking a multidisciplinary approach? Uh, Dr. Monica, would you like to start off today? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. It's uh, afternoon time in India. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, question. I think today the need of the hour is multidisciplinary education because uh, the manner in which the internet revolution has happened and uh, it's not just uh, restricted to the social media but uh, specifically during the COVID times, there's been a huge amount of, uh, you know, the entire shift of the education has happened uh, in the online. And uh, this has given a lot of freedom and flexibility to our students. And uh, I do believe there are a lot of new opportunities that are coming up for the student community. Ultimately, especially in India, everyone's looking for a career uh, after their educational degree. And uh, there are a lot of multidisciplinary opportunities that have come up. It could be in the field of medical technology, med tech. It could be in the field of agriculture technology, agri tech, or it could be in educational technology itself, ed tech. So there are various such multidisciplinary job opportunities that are coming up. And because of this, I do believe multidisciplinary education is the need of the hour. So, uh, further, uh, the climate change concerns that are there in the society, they all require a little out of the box thinking. So multidisciplinary approach, I think would be mandatory in all aspects of our life and of the business. And this also, as I've already told you, it helps the students to be job ready. Uh, one more thing, I mean, I would just like to bring to your notice is that along with technology uh, enhancements, there's a lot of focus on traditional aspects of life and living. Once again, you know, you need to go back in time and look at the scriptures and our uh, earlier styles of living. And all of them are now coming out in the forefront. So the mandate is for multidisciplinary education. Thank you. I hope you could hear me. My voice is a little bad today. Yes, we can hear you absolutely fine. Thank you. Thank you. We'll let your voice recover for a minute and I'll put a question to Dr. Amick. Um, Dr. Monica spoke about um, the climate change crisis and another crisis we've obviously seen in recent years is the COVID-19 crisis. And I think those two issues are really strong examples of why a multidisciplinary holistic collaborative approach is absolutely essential in the real world but when students aren't facing that level of uh, crisis Dr Amick how do you in a in a kind of safe university environment equip them with those skills to communicate with each other and to learn across all sorts of different disciplines
Sorry, I just think you're on mute at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's for me, Ashton? Yes, um, please. Okay, right, right, right. Thank you very much, Ashton. Uh, yeah, first of all, I'd like to just uh, briefly mention that uh, uh, I am representing an institution which is uh, primarily catering for engineering education. And uh, uh, we, we have got uh, other three schools as the uh, pharmacy management and the computer applications. Uh, so my, uh, my sharing of knowledge in this session uh, and the best practices, they will revolve around uh, mostly the engineering. And uh, uh, see, pandemic has been a blessing. I say that uh, the blessing has done a lot of, uh, uh, pandemic has done a lot of good uh, to the education industry uh, in terms of, uh, you know, making everybody aware about uh, how to go digital. Uh, like uh, everybody else, uh, 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 my institution also, uh, we were in the experimental phase in the beginning and then uh, we consolidated after a few months and maybe in the month of say, uh, July last year, uh, we had a beautiful policy where we could identify a platform. We also created a own LMS on Moodle. Also, we had a large number of uh, self-shoot videos uh, by uh, the faculty members. We could also make the virtual labs. Uh, and that was really a learning for all of us because they say the necessity is the mother of invention, uh, which led to um, uh, you know, uh, uh, having these virtual labs also by our own students and the faculty. Now, we, we, we learned about uh, the importance of uh, uh, the multidisciplinary education in a big manner uh, when we started using the large number of online courses which were available during that period. Now, I would like to mention specifically that uh, the Coursera courses uh, during that time, uh, I'm very happy and very satisfied to find that almost uh, there were 34,000 registrations on the courses, on the Coursera courses by our faculty members, by our students, and also by the non-teaching staff. We never saw that kind of enthusiasm from the non-teaching staff where a large number of them, they registered for the courses and ultimately we had close to 12,000 courses which were, which were completed by, uh, by, the, uh, by the faculty, students and the staff. Now we, we saw and we felt that the multidisciplinary or I'll say the interdisciplinary learning uh, in terms of the machine learning, Python, data science, you know, data structure, programming, cyber security, all these oh, could be possible because that kind of exposure we could get for the first time because in an institution which is working totally on the offline mode, it's not possible uh, to give exposure to such variety of courses, uh, which I mentioned. And uh, even my non-circuit branches, you know, my electrical and uh, mechanical, civil, you know, they also had a huge exposure to various online courses through the Coursera and of course other platforms as well. Now, this was uh, really amazing for everyone. And then uh, we created the LMS in which uh, say a particular topic, which is there, that uh, particular topic is all course material particular to pertaining to that topic was put on the Moodle. So it became a learning and it became a very powerful tool. Now, uh, this multidisciplinary education, uh, basically we, 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 we found that uh, uh, some of the branches like uh, those from the engineering background, they would agree that uh, there has been a spurt in the uh, job market uh, as far as the automation is concerned. All the circuit branches, uh, they've, take, they've taken a large number of uh, job sectors, uh, job profiles. Now it was a big challenge. Now this exposure of multidisciplinary, it really came handy once the students from the circuit branches, uh, that is uh, from mechanical, civil, electrical, and EC, they started going for, for the automation. They started learning the programming language. And we, we, we very fondly said that the uh, third language in the campus would be the programming language of your choice. Now with that, uh, there has been a direct benefit to everyone, to all the students. And uh, not only in our institution, I see all across, uh, the job market was open to uh, not only the circuit branches, even to the non-circuit branches, and there have been a phenomenal increase in the jobs. The number of jobs which have gone to the core sector, the automation uh, jobs, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this also created a new opportunity for everyone. So I think the multidisciplinary came up in a very, very big manner. Now, another thing which I found is that uh, uh, the, the convincing uh, power which the student had 
that if they want to work in a mechanical core sector or an electrical core sector they they need to know uh, the application part of uh, the software once they know the application part of the software they can eventually go to work uh, in the core industry but the but but their route would be through through uh, through the, the you know uh, uh, companies which are uh, working on the automation so that understanding and that awareness among the student it really uh, created the awareness and i found that uh, this is the best example of a multidisciplinary education uh, where uh, everybody uh, became uh, became it literate and they could uh, contribute in their core sectors uh, uh, through the it route now another thing which i would like to mention here is that uh, uh, this exposure has really uh, put a lot of uh, lot of uh, spate a lot of improvement in in the uh, in the projects the quality of projects the quality of projects actually have become interdisciplinary now uh, because is solving a society problem is not possible that only one one particular branch students are able to solve it it has to be effort uh, by various branches so we could find that almost 30% of our projects uh, which is normally done by the students in the final year 30% of the projects they were interdisciplinary in nature which actually they address the society problem they they address the problem given by the industry uh, so i think uh, these are the few things uh, which uh, really the students uh, and the whole environment uh, they made use uh, during this uh, uh, pandemic uh, now uh, there are few challenges there's a, no no doubt about the challenges i think that we can talk later but ultimately uh, this learning of about a year what we had uh, this learning was very very useful to all of us now is responsibility of each one of us that the whatever learnings have been accrued those learnings must continue we should not allow the learnings to get faded away from a, a normal day to day working or in the normal learning uh, the blended mode of learning uh, should be the new normal uh, that's what i feel very strongly feel uh, in, in the times to come yeah that's all thank you very much thank you we've had a question from the audience here and i would just like to take this moment to remind the audience that we do have a q and a box at the bottom of your screen so please do send us your questions um the question is for dr amik um and it's how did you move 34000 students and faculty okay. members to yeah. coursera and i'd yeah, like to just really... add to that as well um I think that you you spoke about the blessing that the pandemic was in some ways because people were more open to kind of rethinking um, the way that they were learning and teaching. But how now, when the novelty of that has worn off and people are perhaps tired of online learning, how do you seize on this moment and make sure that people continue to engage with with platforms like Coursera? Right. Uh, yeah, very interesting question. Uh, and uh, see, uh, we have, as I mentioned, we have got about uh, six thousand uh, students in the campus and about uh, five thousand uh, odd faculty and uh, staff. Uh, now, I am of very strong opinion that uh, it's very difficult to uh, motivate the masses for a long time. So, what we had done was uh, that uh, now in the in our curriculum uh, given by the AICT, All India Council of Technical Education. Uh, there is a mandatory requirement of uh, doing the internship every year. You know, you have to go for the internship after the first year, second year, and third year. Now, during this pandemic, it was not possible that uh, the, the students go out and do the internship. So we had gone for a model, a blended kind of a model within the internship, where we could have an online connect uh, with the companies, and also uh, we we made the students attend the courses uh, on the platform like Coursera. I say about 30 hours of courses was made mandatory as a part of the internship. Now that was one of the way uh, because once you are dealing with the masses, I said it's very difficult to motivate them. You know, keep the motivation uh, going for a very long time. So you need to somewhere, sometime, you know, connect it with the uh, with the credits which are which are there in the university. So from that perspective, uh, we had asked all students to register, uh, you know, to do at least 30 hours of uh, Coursera courses or the other platform courses. But we found the maximum response uh, of the students and faculty on the uh, Coursera courses. So 34,000 are the total registration of the students. The students are, as I mentioned, less, but the students had registered to large number of courses. But then, as you know, you know, they didn't complete. The completed courses were only 12,000. Uh, so that was also a very good number. And now 
as a result of that, uh, you know, the, the students have got the taste. They know at their own pace, they can learn uh, the particular course. Uh, they can again uh, view it and again move forward as per their own convenience. So that kind of exposure was given to a quality education, a quality course material from uh, through the platform of Coursera. Uh, so I think that was one of the way. And now, now, I, now we have gone into a partnership uh, again uh, with the Coursera and the large number of courses are being attempted by our students and faculty. Uh, so I'll talk of that uh, later on once uh, once uh, get the opportunity again as to how we are, uh, how we are going ahead uh, in, into more depth with Coursera uh, to create a minor specialization for our students. Yeah, I think I will answer this question very quickly. Thank you very much. We've spoken obviously about Coursera and the importance of digital tools in supporting the implementation of a multidisciplinary approach. Um, Raghav, can you speak to us a little bit about um, exactly how Coursera supports that kind of learning? Yeah, absolutely, Ashton, and uh, you know, an absolute pleasure to be here and to be listening to Dr. Monica and Dr. Uh, Garg and to learn from their experiences as well. Um, I always find it helpful, you know, before we talk about higher education to talk about what's happening in industry a little bit. And Dr. Monica did speak about it uh, as well. And, you know, as Coursera, we work with thousands of businesses uh, around the world and in, in the country. And we've seen some consistent themes through the course of the pandemic across many of these businesses. Um, almost every business has said that they are going to digitalize a lot more. Um, almost every business has said that even after the pandemic, work from home will continue. And many businesses have seen traditional jobs uh, that have been lost, traditional skills that have been lost, especially if it required a repeatable human uh, task. And what this has done is that it is causing working professionals like you know all of us uh, uh, at this event today to rethink some of the skills of the future, right? And uh, our data, and we have abundance of data coming out from our platform, but our data tells us that the need for digital skills, uh, the need for data related skills, the need for human skills is becoming all pervasive. You know, uh, it's a different ball game to be working with a virtual team day in, day out with people located in different cultures, which is why the, new, the need for human skills is becoming important. And irrespective of whether you are somebody who is working in technology or you're working in a bank or you're working in an HR function, chances are that some form of analytics, some form of digital skills are required. And because of some of this, what we are seeing is that, you know, uh, uh, the kind of opportunities that are available to students are changing very quickly. And, you know, Dr. Monica represents a business school. Uh, we're seeing, for example, for MBA students, managing uh, digital transformation is uh, uh, becoming important, right? Managing a team that runs data analytics is becoming important. Managing a business that has digital products is becoming important. Um, even uh, more technical topics like AI and machine learning are becoming important for machine learning, uh, for, for management students. I was talking to the director of a, a leading business school in India the other day, and they've made Python programming mandatory for first semester students because they believe this form of interdisciplinary learning is going to be uh, the base skill going forward. Like today, most of us, many of us know Excel and Word, but tomorrow possibly uh, skills like Python are going to be base skills. And in all of this context, I think interdisciplinary learning and online education come to the picture. I find it fascinating. One of the top computer science programs in the world comes from the University of uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, I was reading a quote from the Dean of the College of Engineering and Berkeley, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, read it out here. And he says that uh, collaboration with social sciences and humanities becomes all the more important with the growing economic, social, and political impact of technological advances. So this is, you know, Dean of one of the top programs in the world talking about collaboration with social sciences and humanity is becoming extremely important in this context. And so I think in all of this context, I think the topic that we have today, which is around the need for interdisciplinary learning becomes extremely topical. And there is, I think we've moved from a, a, a situation earlier where everything that our students learned came from 
within the four walls of the institution came from faculty, which was largely within the institution. Some of them were visiting faculty, but we moved to a situation where, you know, we will see maybe 60, 70, 80% of learning coming from within the four walls of the institution, but the rest coming from outside the institution, possibly via platforms like Coursera and Dr. Garg shared their own experiences of how this has become a habit for many of their students and many of their faculty members. But I think the wider context of why this is happening and why interdisciplinary learning is going to play a large role given how industry has changed and given how leading institutions like UC Berkeley and others are changing is possibly helpful for us to keep in mind as well. Thank you. I've got another audience question here that I think is quite relevant to what you've just spoken on, Magav. It's about student engagement and how, um, what sort of plans can be launched to increase student engagement on e-learning platforms. Um, Raghav, could you just tell us a little bit about how, what student engagement looks like in online learning and how you can increase that? And then perhaps I'll also ask, um, uh, the rest of our panelists, what their experience has been of the same of the same issue. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it starts with um, you know uh, realizing that you're trying to drive habit change, and driving habit change needs change management. You know, all of us have grown up sitting in a classroom and listening to uh, somebody talking to us, right? And when you ask people to do that in an online environment where they are uh, self-paced, then you're driving change management. So I think it starts with that. And I think any change management has certain elements which you know uh, will apply in any change management situation. So first element is going to be how are you going to drive motivation for that change to get enabled, right? And like Dr. Garg said, if uh, students are interested in careers of the future, if they are interested in a strong first job opportunity, and if that job opportunity is changing and we communicate to the students that look, if you are a computer science student, just a BTEC computer science is not enough. You possibly need a BTEC computer science with specialization in AI. Uh, and the AI part of the specialization is gonna come from an online platform like Coursera, then you've built that motivation. You've built uh, that. So the first element of driving change management is communicating and driving motivation. The second element of all of this is driving senior leadership to communicate some of these messages, right? So if at an institution, um, if the leadership of that institution is communicating how the world around us has changed and we need to think about driving, you know, towards that change and that is the second element of this, uh, this uh, change. The third element, and I think uh, many of us in India will appreciate this quite significantly is Sometimes we have great uh, quality education, but many times, unfortunately, we don't have great quality education uh, in uh, our many institutions. And so one of the things that Coursera does well is just bring absolutely the best quality education because you know I can today come to Coursera and learn from the Secretary General of the United Nations. I can come to Coursera and learn from somebody who's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. I can come to Coursera and learn from somebody who's got a Nobel Prize in economics. So just the quality of that going up, I think is very, very significant. And then lastly, you know, students in higher education are used to technology products which are absolutely high quality because they are digital natives. They are used to Facebook, and, and, and sorry, I shouldn't say Facebook. They're used to Instagram. They're used to Snapchat. Facebook is more for people of our generation. Uh, they're used to you know uh, uh, all the re most recent products which are extremely user friendly. And so a platform like Coursera has to be a great product experience as well in terms of the user experience. Just how you log in, you know what the video quality is, what the text quality is what are the uh, engaging elements of the questions that you're being asked as you progress through a course, are there nudges driven by AI, which tell you be careful here, you know, watch out here and so on and so forth. We released a report called the drivers of quality in online education, where we mined a lot of our data and said what makes for high quality courses in an online platform. And you know, it puts out a lot of these, uh, these insights to say, look, if you're engaging students by asking them questions, if you have summative assessments, formative assessments, if you're also able to provide a discussion forum. So just the platform experience, the product experience has to be all of that. But it's not just the uh, product as I'm trying to emphasize, it's the realization that this is change management, it is building motivation, it is driving change from a senior level, and it is also bringing top quality content as well. Uh, that's possibly 
a longish answer, but yeah, that's what I'd like to say on that. Thank you. Thank you. That certainly uh, answers the question, I think. And um, we've briefly touched on hybrid learning and blended learning. And I'd like to speak a little bit more about um, Dr. Monica, if you feel that a hybrid approach to teaching better supports that holistic education, or do you think a fully in-person or a fully remote model is more well suited to that? <coughs> I think uh, today hybrid education is the way forward. I mean, you know, there has to be a blend of offline and online education. Uh, with the uh, online education, the classroom boundaries have broken. And, you know, we can get the best faculty uh, from any parts of the world. And ultimately, it is for the student. I mean, when you are uh, learning, when you're uh, working towards a degree, the endeavor has to be to learn from the best. And I think the best can happen only through the hybrid platform. So, you know, you have this local context and you may have the regional or the global context. And that would come only through hybrid education. Of course, there are certain areas like engineering and all in medical field where, you know, it may not work so well. But I think in liberal arts and social sciences, these things would really uh, work very well. Uh, as an institution at the KJ Sumaya Institute of Management, we have uh, really adopted the hybrid uh, format of education. And uh, we conduct a lot of panel discussions and masterclasses on the uh, online platforms. And uh, we are able to connect with uh, you know, uh, the industry and the academia stalwarts from anywhere in the world. I think one good thing that happened last year uh, was a lot of alumni engagement that happened and that's international alumni engagement also because earlier it was very difficult to get people, motivate them to leave their job for a day and come to the campus and interact with our students. But today I think the flexibility that's come in because of the online platform, I think that's something which is, uh, we all should take advantage of it and try to build in more and more, you know, uh, value. I think we will be able to build more value into educational outcomes if we have the uh, hybrid uh, mode of learning. And also, you know, it's like ubiquitous learning anywhere, anytime, you know, suppose there's a panel discussion going on, the student could join in from any device and from any location. I think that convenience part uh, we should not forget, and all of us should rapidly adopt the hybrid form of uh, learning. I think another important thing that's happening is a lot of experiential learning that's offline. So if you blend experiential learning with the uh, global best faculty or regional best faculty, I think it's a win-win situation for everyone. Uh, earlier also, if you just see, the entire focus was classroom and rote learning. I think some way this rote learning and the crazy uh, orientation for marks, I think it should come down a little bit and it would be more about exploring your own skills, your own interests and try to develop them into something. So definitely the focus I think would be more on the student who's the biggest stakeholder in the educational system. So earlier, if you ask me honestly, I'd like to draw an analogy if you permit me, between a Western buffet style of food where you have all the dishes displayed and the student and the, and the guest is moving around. And uh, the Indian style is a Thali style where you, know, you sit in one place and things are just served to you. So I think some way we are moving from the Thali system to the, you know, to the buffet style where the consumer can pick and choose what he wants. So, so that, that would happen only through hybrid education. Ultimately, we should not lose sight of the biggest stakeholders, the student, the student and the industry. I think they are the biggest stakeholders in the education system. And uh, we should try and see that we give the best to these two stakeholders. That's my take. 
Thank you. The, um, the, the buffet analogy is interesting because um, I wonder if students are given too much choice. Um, well, is there such a thing as too much choice, but do you perhaps go and pick all of the deep fried bits and, and no one wants to take any salad from the buffet? So is there perhaps the role of the institution becomes more of a um, kind of mentorship and guidance to say, I know that that looks tasty, but this will make you make you feel better tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Amick, would you agree that there's room for more of a buffet style choice for students, but without letting them, um, you know, go too wild? <laughs> Dr. Amick, do you think that that's a model that, that you would agree with? I think I would say it's, you know, the institutional role and the role of the teacher is more on mentoring and guiding. What are the best options, you know? Suppose I want to make my career in, let's say, agri-tech. That's something which is very big today. You know, so I would guide the student accordingly. You know, so I think the role of the teacher the role of the educator then is more of mentoring and guiding the student towards what are the best options. Otherwise, there will be a problem of plenty and you may come out feeling a little dissatisfied. So I think we need, uh, the teacher should also gear up towards uh, you know, a more mature role of mentoring and guiding the students rather than just force fitting things you know, into the system. I think that is something that the teachers, uh, I think the entire system has to get overruled. You know, because we in India, especially, we are used to a certain way of working. And uh, there's a lot of inbuilt inertia. There's a lot of, uh, you know, the laissez-faire happening. But uh, with this system, you need to be more proactive, keep scanning the environment and looking at your own strengths and weaknesses and then planning your career. So I think that the, role, the entire educational value chain has to undergo a change. Every player in the value chain, I think their role is changing a little bit. And somewhere it may be a very big change, but ultimately uh, the entire educational value chain is undergoing a change. What it was earlier from an assembly line Today, it is cha completely changing. That's what I can see. Thank you. Dr. Monica, you also spoke about um, having the best quality in a hybrid and blended model because you're able to access people from around the world. And that internationalization is another thing that's quite important in the national education policy. Um, and in supporting multidisciplinary learning. So Dr. Garg, is that international uh, mindset and approach something that is important to your university? Do you think it should be important to all universities? And also, how do you implement a, a globally facing um, approach for institutions? Thank you, Ashton. Ashton, if you permit, I wanted to answer the questions which came uh onto the, uh, this thing, uh, the two questions which were posed. Uh, one was, um, are the teams uh, for multidisciplinary projects made with students across discipline? And the second was, uh, 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 it was about uh, multidisciplinary uh, projects and the student engagement plans. Uh, can I answer these two questions quickly, if you permit? Uh, yes, should... please do. Okay. Right, right, right. Because I feel that they are directly uh, pertaining to me, so I must uh, uh, share my experiences in that. Uh, see, the multidisciplinary projects, uh, they were made with the students across disciplines. Now, we, a number of institutions uh, have done it and more institutions can do it. You know, the projects which are there, which have to be done, for example, a final year project. Uh, I very strongly feel that the final year project, uh, a quality project should be allotted early to the student while they are in the third year itself. And now the purpose of that is that once they face the placement company, which is now at the beginning of the uh, fourth year, the seventh semester, you know, they have got something to show to the, to the visiting companies, you know, for doing the placement drives. 
so in that uh, what uh, can be done is that the students say from one particular branch say computer science there may be out of a batch of five students one or two students can be from say electrical branch or a different branch you know and i'll go a step ahead one of the student can be from the second year uh, from a different branch so this can be a multidisciplinary project and once the when the project is completed uh, then they, there is there are student from the junior year you know to take that project forward uh, to to the you know required destination uh, of the to solve the industry problem or to the society problem so this kind of a mindset and the preparation needs to be done uh, at the institutions if we really want to do justice to the projects and this is possible with the multidisciplinary uh, uh, you know the learning the approach the understanding the importance which all of us have uh, learned during this period now second is what can be done about the student engagement plan that was another question the student engagement plans you know one i mentioned that uh, linking the coursera courses with the internships you know that can be one thing second can be as uh, raga was mentioning that a student uh, in computer science he wants to get specialized in artificial intelligence you know i have got a i have got a set of students studying pharmacy but they want to get specialized in artificial intelligence you know it was a very welcome surprise and very soothing uh, surprise to us when when we took the feedback and the student wanted to be specialized in artificial intelligence or machine learning or maybe some other areas so what we have done we have created we have created a, a you know minor specialization courses uh, from the coursera platform and say about 10 courses of a minor specialization and that minor specialization uh, has got the courses which are identified jointly by our faculty as well as the coursera and we are running it such a manner that it is run for all the students like it is run during the vacation and during the during the vacation there are classes the the faculty who are taking these courses these faculty have already done the courses on the coursera platform and then they are they are taking the classes of the students during the vacation and then during the actual semester is on since the curriculum university curriculum is all, all, is all already there then that period is used by the students to undergo these coursera courses so you see that kind of a, a minor specialization in various areas Uh, have been identified and uh, the students uh, are very very excited i have got about uh, 10% of my students uh, who are presently undergoing the minor specialization uh, training now these areas uh, they 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 vary from uh, web to mobile application development or to uh, to the artificial integrated green energy solutions and the smart societies robotics and iot smart infrastructure development and drug regulatory affairs so this is the power of uh, the student engagement that's what i see and uh, and uh, online learning can be really a really a blessing for all of us uh, where the students uh, uh, can actually learn the thing what they want and at the pace they want uh, to learn so this is uh, very very important and i think uh, we we must uh, do the homework uh, being the leaders being the educators at our level and thereafter offer uh, the courses and the similar kind of a specialization or the internships uh, to the students uh, uh, yeah thank you ashtin for that uh, but coming to your question on the internationalization of the uh, indian universities and uh, what is the digital uh, the what is the role of the digital education uh, as dr khanna also uh, mentioned that uh, the connectivity has brought the whole world uh, you know connect to each other Uh, sitting at the comfort of our home uh, now uh, what i see and the national education policy also ashton you mentioned that it talks of the internationalization at home you know it should happen we need to create the quality the enhance the quality of our institutions where we have the internationalization at home you know instead of the students going to the different countries or to the us or to the uk or the other countries you now the ambition of the government is and all of us in the education sector is that the students from the other country should come to our country to india uh, for getting the quality internationalization uh, uh, international quality of education now all that is possible now Uh, because of the large number of changes which are being taken place under the national education policy because we have got a credit recognition under the twinning arrangement now there there would be a kind of a, a multiple entry multiple exit 
uh, you can earn the credits from some university and those credits can be added to your academic bank of uh, accounts academic bank of uh, you know credits uh, so that kind of arrangement is there now uh, it will take some time for the policies to get implemented but as far as the policy issue is concerned that policy is already there now we can have a academic and research collaboration with large number of universities like i am aware the number of colleges number of universities who used to have their international conferences in a physical mode they have stopped uh, going for the uh, you know physical uh, form of a uh, conferences now there is no need that uh, to attend a conference a gentleman uh, or a person or a lady has to travel all the way from the other part of the country, of the world not the same quality of uh, conferences same quality of connect with the students in fact a better connect can happen now this is what i say is very very important that whatever we have learned you know that needs to be encashed we should not allow it to fade away and we need to put our policies in place immediately as uh, was uh, being mentioned by uh, dr monica uh, that uh, we need to have a beautiful kind uh, a blended kind of a learning Uh, in the blended learning is is very important that we understand that uh, only online education is not the right solution we cannot go only online because we have seen that only online uh, has actually uh, done uh, some harm also to the students uh, because you found that the students uh, in a physical classroom the students were compelled to be present uh, but in the virtual uh, class uh, they they are at liberty to leave the classroom whenever they want the writing skills have reduced what we have seen we have also seen that the lack of sufficient hands on training there is no sufficient hands on training and the students they also lack the social disconnection from the classmates uh, in a, one of the surveys we i remember that almost 55% of the students or maybe more probably they felt that there is no social uh, connection with the classmates and also there is no clear guidance from the faculty so online education only online education is not the right solution but we should not allow the online learning to get faded so in my mind you know what to be done be the internationalization of education or our normal learning we should go for a beautiful hybrid education model now what needs to be done uh, we need to work more on to the bloom's taxonomy higher levels you know other than uh, remembering understanding we need to understand how to apply the knowledge analyze evaluate and create the knowledge now all that is possible now to my mind that is possible once we create a moodle or we create a learning management system where all the teaching material in terms of the video by the faculty uh, in terms of uh, some important uh, courses like coursera or maybe some nptel links or maybe some uh, some animation all those information is available to the student topic wise now student should visit all these links and he should come prepared for a discussion in the class you know that is what is required the classes should not be a kind of a monologue it should be a two way communication where the discussion takes place where where there is a discussion about about the creating a particular problem a working about the project you know where the, the student need to be thinkers now all of us are aware that the human beings are primarily designed for action to create not for listening to the lectures or just to memorize the facts so the purpose of education should be to give all the student the knowledge and skills and to become the independent thinkers so i think it's a golden opportunity which in the form of uh, uh, the hybrid education all the educators everybody must uh, quickly uh, take the appropriate decision in their own environment and see that the classes are made interesting and we work on the higher levels of the bloom bloom taxonomy where it's just not on the paper just not for the nba visits or just not for the other visits we really implement the higher order thinking skills in letter and spirit in our classrooms yeah these are my views uh, ashton thank you very much we've spoken a lot today about the delivery of education being um multidisciplinary and skills focused but if you rethink delivery then you have to rethink assessment as well um so ragav from your experience on coursera assessing your users what how do you think that assessment needs to be uh, rethought given the wider changes to the world of work and also the the world of learning and teaching may, may i suggest you know we have the practitioners the academic leaders here they'll answer this question a lot better than i will 
Do you want to get them in and maybe I can add a couple of points towards the later part of it as well? Yes, I certainly can. Dr. Monica, do you want to talk to us about assessment? Sorry, it's just on mute at the moment. Yeah, in the change scenario where, you know, knowledge and information is available at the tip of your fingers, I think the entire assessment should be more of application based. You know, it cannot be define something and do something. That's not the thing. Today, the entire thing should be application based. And also, if you see, there are a lot of situations, and especially in the last one and a half to two years, it has been revealed. These are all situations which people never thought about. They're coming up out of the blue, so-called the black swan events, you know. Suddenly you're faced with a situation which you never even thought about. So I, I think the entire concept of assessment should be application. How can you apply your knowledge and theory to what is the situation that you're facing in front of you? I, that also would reduce the concept of, you know, mass uh, cheating and things like that, because we all need to apply our knowledge to a particular situation. We also need to visualize what could happen in the future. I think the entire concept has to change. As I told you, I mean, today, I don't think the, when the industry comes to recruit a student, I'm not too sure if he's really looking at the marks. If they're looking at the marks, it could be more of shortlisting candidates. But beyond that, I think they're looking at creativity and application based. Without that, I think it's of no use to the industry. And especially for the young generation, they are better equipped with new technology and new tools and fresh energy, fresh thinking. I think they can do a lot of out of the box thinking. So let us not uh, restrict and confine the student to mugging and you know reproducing definitions and things like that. I think those days are completely over. If you ask me who should I recruit in my institution, let's say a faculty, for example, I think beyond the base of being a PhD and this and that, I'd like to know how quickly is he able to adapt to new pedagogical tools and how much is he open-minded to learn new things? You know, because I think today, even for the faculty, the knowledge of citizens is very big threat. I can ultimately ask only that question of which I'm comfortable with. I think the teacher also has to raise their level. So both the teacher, unless the teacher raises their level and thinks out of the box, I think you can't expect the student to do that. So we seriously need to relook at the entire value chain as I told you. It has to be through case studies. It has to be through application based and it has to be real life experiential learning opportunities. It could be through some, you know, community initiatives and things like that. Like I would like to give an example, another example from my institute. So on our campus, we have a primary school uh, which is a Gujarati medium school. It's a quite an old school, but uh, over the years, the number of students in the Gujarati school have really dwindled because you know most students want to learn in the English medium, but these are all children from the slums and very low economic uh, uh, strata of society. So our management students, uh, we have a, a, you know, a platform called as Ankuri Eli, where every Friday afternoon, our management students go and teach them conversational English and they teach them a little bit of math and things like that. So, you know, and uh, at the end of the three hour session, our students are supposed to write a report on what is it that they learned when they taught these small tiny dots. And our students also make the effort of going to the slums and meeting the parents of these children and trying to understand the socioeconomic context of these children. Now with this type of education, I think the role of the examination goes down considerably. It is more of what have I learned? What have I visualized? What, what can I see? Can I see opportunities? Can I see challenges? And another thing that the students also appreciate 
is that management is not just for organized sector of society. There are a lot of people who really need professional management skills, but they are completely unorganized sector, or they may be out of the purview of uh, you know professional management skills and things like that. So my personal view would be, don't think of assessment again in a very narrow way. Open our minds and we think of a lot of possibilities. That's the only, that's the way forward. Because Actually, the problem- If I could add a quick example to what Dr. Yeah. Monica spoke about as well, in terms of the focus of applications being assessments oriented. And I was earlier talking about, you know, possibly an MBA student as an example, looking to work in digital marketing or possibly in enterprise marketing. One of the things that we've seen a lot of success with at Coursera is middle of last year to complement courses on the Coursera platform, we launched something called guided projects. And the intent of a guided project is if you have to learn a digital tool, you can come and do a project of that digital tool on Coursera. So if I'm an MBA student wanting to work in digital marketing, I possibly need to learn you know, search engine optimization. I probably need to learn a tool like Canva for creative design and so on. And sometimes to find an instructor to you know, buy the software, all of that can be quite expensive. Instead of doing all of that, I can come to a guided project on Coursera and actually build a project on Canva, build a project on search engine optimization. And similarly, again, if I'm an MBA student who's wanting to work in enterprise marketing, along with learning the concept and the theory of enterprise marketing, I can come and do a guided project on a tool like Marketo and if Coursera were to come and interview me, Coursera would ask you, do you know Marketo? And you know, I can then show that I've done a guided project on Marketo. So I, I completely uh, see a lot of value in what Dr. Monica shared. And I think bringing application-based assessments via guided projects, and there were upwards of 2,000 of these guided projects on our platform very quickly, but we've seen a lot of success by bringing those to campuses in the country and elsewhere. Thank you, Agav. Um, Dr. Garg, did you want to speak as well on assessment? I think it. I think it'd be really interesting to hear the way that your institution is perhaps rethinking the way that that works. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, see, uh, we what we have realized uh, over a period of time that uh, the answer to the assessment uh, lies only to a large extent, if not to hundred percent, on the proctored assessment. We need to go, if at all we are going for the online assessment, it has to be proctored. Uh, now that uh, is uh, quite uh, okay, successful. I mean, uh, there is uh, not a question of mass cheating in that, whether the cheating definitely is there, but its quantum is definitely reduced. Now that probably is one of the solution. Uh, now, another thing what uh, we have seen is uh, to be very, very effective during the online classes is uh, uh, having a continuous assessment. You know, each lecture, each lecture, we, uh, I mean, the, uh, a lot of universities have got a system where there is a small quiz uh, which can be offered to the students, and then the students are answering those answer, those, those quiz uh, questions within the classroom only, mm -hmm. and that uh, so that is ensuring that uh, they they have learned. Uh, or they have come prepared uh, for uh, that particular uh, lecture. So this is another thing uh, which I found to be uh, relevant. Uh, but uh, uh, the answer lies uh, probably we need to change uh, our way of assessment. We need to uh, you know, get above uh, this pen and paper. We need to probably more go for more of case study presentations than the assessment where the students uh, are uh, uh, promoted to come forward and present their views uh, independently. And that can be done beautifully in the online mode. You know, that can be done. There is a flexibility of the timing also. It can be done uh, as per the convenience of, of both the faculty and the students. Uh, so this is, again, a very, very good thing. Now, I'd like to share uh, my experience on uh, how to go for the Coursera assessments. Like, uh, uh, this was one of the things what, uh, what came across that sir, if we are going for the Coursera courses, uh, how do we ensure that the assessment is as per the our standard of the university? So, uh, for that, we could find a very, very uh, you know, practical solution, as I mentioned. So the faculty probably can do these courses before they are before the students are made to undergo the courses 
and once the faculty they know then uh, they know that uh, what is the total syllabus of that particular course or, or what is the total syllabus of that particular specialization and accordingly the question papers can be made by the faculty members uh, which is meeting the requirement of the specialization and the accord of credits so these are a few things and few practices uh, which uh, probably uh, can be done and uh, i'm sure it it should stay now in in my institution uh, we have identified some of the subjects uh, uh, where we are going not for the pen and paper assessment we are going for the proctored online assessment now we found it to be very effective and uh, to our surprise it is coming out to be even cost effective also in comparison to the the printing of the answer sheets and others and also it provides a lot of flexibility to the students so some form maybe around the 15 to 20% of all our examinations are uh, in a proctored assessment mode uh, so what i'll say that uh, i mean no no one thing will fit to all i mean it has to be customized it has to be seen and, and in our uh, in your own environment uh, what is most suitable that needs to be adopted as far as the assessments are concerned Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with Dr. Hamid. I think the stress around exams must go. Yeah, and uh, I somehow feel I'm not sure if I'm right. I think India is the only country in the world where students commit suicide because they didn't get good marks. This is rubbish. This is absolute ridiculous. This is not the way to teach, and this is not the what outcomes of education should be. Education should prepare you for the real world. and marks is just one part of it i think our entire concept of education is very skewed so to say and especially i think in the school level and uh, you know when students come to higher education there's a lot of unlearning they have to do because when you're teaching them some subject you don't give them some ready notes and things like that they're supposed to explore the subject so like bmw says the joy of driving i would like i would like to say the joy of learning i think we have built so much stress in the system that uh, students are really scared and uh, i the entire uh, focus is just on marks and passing that's why they cheat and you know they copy and they do all of things so uh, we are talking of very fundamental questions i think of what is the purpose of education is it just to get a degree in a job or is it just to prepare you for the real world i also believe this is my belief i also feel a lot of times students do not understand that they're doing anything unethical if they're copying from somebody i think it's ethical because they have to get more marks they have to somehow pass so if unless you have application based learning uh things would not change you know they don't understand what is ethical and not ethical i think that also i by observation i can tell you that so we are actually discussing fundamental questions and how ultimately it's about online education i think a lot of lot of opportunities would open up for people and student community i think we are doing a favor to them by giving them hybrid and lot of choices and things like that thank you dr monica i really appreciate your sentiment about bringing back the joy of learning to institutions and i think that's also a good place for us to end our discussion today um so i'd like to thank all three of our panelists again for joining us and sharing your insights it's been really great to hear from all of you and also to our audience for joining us and sending over a, a great deal of really interesting questions as well. Um, there'll be an on-demand video recording of today's session and also a summary article. So please do take a look at those if you want to revisit anything that we've discussed today. I hope to see you all again very soon to, to continue this conversation. Um, but for now, I'll just say thank you again for joining us and goodbye. <laughs>